UK house prices, as evidenced by both the Nationwide and Halifax data recently, continue to rise at a rate of around about 10% year-on-year, boosted by the government's stamp duty holiday, which is due to end this month. What's causing it? And will it, or can it, continue? Welcome to this edition of IG Trading the Markets podcast. I'm Jeremy Naylor. I'm talking today to Andrew Wishart, UK property economist at Capital Economics. Andrew, it's good to be able to talk to you. Thanks indeed for your time. Let's start off with that base question. What is the cause of these rise in prices? Well, I think there's a a number of of causes. I think the first thing to point out is it's not a phenomenon that we've just seen in the UK. Globally, um, house prices have been doing very well. And I think obviously the the first thing that stands out is that governments have stepped in to support um, household incomes and completely isolate them from uh, the effects of the pandemic effectively. So that's the sort of first building block. And then on top of that, you've got um, high household savings during lockdown. And then you've got also a, a reassessment of, of housing preferences as people think about where they might want to live if they're going to be remote working more. And then, of course, you're right as well in the UK to, to bring up the, uh, the stamp duty holiday, which has certainly you know, increased that urgency to move, uh, which, is, which has certainly led to very high demand, particularly from home movers who, who benefit most from stamp duty savings. Um, and that's led to a very tight market dynamic with, um, with very high transactions, uh, which means that there's lots of buyers and not much stock at the market at any given time, which has led to the sort of house prices being bid up. OK, so there's a simple economic sort of equation of demand and supply, I guess, there going on to some degree. Can you tell me how this figure is represented across the country? I was talking there about that uh, 10% rise that we've got recently from two of the largest uh, mortgage uh, companies nationwide in Halifax. Uh, across the country, my, my understanding is that there are some very different sort of dynamics a- appearing. You mentioned the fact that, you know, people are moving. People's idea about where they want to live, of course, has changed during the pandemic. People want more space. They want perhaps probably bigger homes. They want to be able to afford more. How has this changed the dynamic around the country? Yes, yeah, so I think that's certainly part of it. What's happened is, you know, in London and the South East, we've seen much lower house price growth, probably about I think about 3% year on year in London, well over 10% in some parts of the North and the Midlands. And it's certainly part of it is, yes, um, probably people who have got a high uh, home movers with lots of equity in a house in London or the South East moving elsewhere where they can if they're remote working um, has probably pushed up house prices in other regions. But also I think um, probably perhaps a larger reason is actually that affordability um, in terms of house price to earnings ratios were already quite high in London compared to the rest of the country. So there's just more scope for house price gains in other regions. Okay, so my next question is, is whether or not this sort of rise that we're seeing at the moment, here we are now pretty much halfway through the year, we've seen this most recent data, is the trajectory that we've got in house prices able to sustain itself for the, for the rest of this year? Or is there, according to some people, the doomsters amongst us, suggesting there's gonna be a house price collapse? So I think we sort of sit in the in the middle of those two camps. I think certainly when the stamp duty holiday does end, um, it will reduce that sort of urgency to move and that will, re- will lead to a, to a cooling in house price growth. Um, we saw that uh, in sort of February, March before the stamp duty holiday was extended, house price increases cooled off a bit. And we're expecting to see that again. In fact, we can already see in the sort of Google Trends data, people looking at right move and Zoopla, that um, demand is starting to tail off a bit. However, we're not forecasting any reversal of the gains we've seen over the past year, because ultimately we think that with mortgage rates where they are and uh, employment prospects looking good as the sort of progress against the virus in the UK it seems to be very good, um, that you know, house prices will be able to sustain the gains they've made over the past year. So this loan to income point is, is interesting, isn't it? I mean, assuming that we are in jobs that are um, long term and, and they're, they're, they're well rewarded, um, we do have the income to, to sustain the current levels. How does this change if the Bank of England starts to raise interest rates? The first point to make here is that currently the spread between mortgage rates over bank rate is is quite large. So I think um, potentially uh, one, two, maybe even three hikes might not push up mortgage rates that much. However, you know, if we did see a a larger rise in in interest rates than that, certainly that would weigh on house prices. That would weigh on how much people were 
were willing to borrow because in the historically people tend to um, put about 25% of their income towards um, mortgage repayments and that and and at the moment we're at that level but obviously if you start raising mortgage interest rates that's when you might see people have to um, put a larger share of their income towards mortgage repayments and you know that was the key indicator uh, in 19, uh, 1989 and then 2007 ahead of house price corrections so at the moment that's still about in line with its long run average um, despite very high loan to income ratios just because mortgage rates are, are low our, our, our medium term view really is that we don't expect bank rate to rise um, for three or four years. So uh, we don't see a correction sort of in the, in the medium term, but certainly pushing out beyond that. And if we were to continue to see large house price gains, it would be something that might come onto the radar a bit more. If we were to see a continuation of the house price gains, would the monetary authorities want to step in, do you think? Do you think that would encourage them then to start to restrict some of the liquidity that we already have in the market? Is that what you're worried about? Well, this is sort of the first big test for the Bank of England's rules about um, how much uh, households can borrow relative to their income. Um, so uh, in 2014, the last time we saw quite strong house price growth, um, they put in a place a rule that meant the borrower should be able to afford the mortgage, even if the interest rate rose by three percentage points over the standard variable rate. I think we're going to see now whether that rule actually works and cools the market. Um, the Bank of England was actually thinking about loosening that rule. Uh, a year ago, I think now that it it won't. So I guess this will be the first real test of that. Uh, and I think that they probably would want to do something if they continue to see double digit house price increases for the next two or three years, then I think at that point, mm. definitely they they think this isn't working. We need to tighten things up. But clearly that's not your base case. How you've already explained the fact you're expecting a far smaller rise. Um, yeah. let, me, let me just return if I can to the point you made about the economic recovery. What is the economic recovery looking like um, according to capital economics? What, 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 what have we got? Is it, is it a bit lumpy? Is it quite well spread? Are we able to sustain higher rates of growth without seeing too much of a, a rise in, let's say, wages? Because that goes back into this business about affordability again. Do you see wages being relatively subdued in this new wave of growth that we're going to get back into um, something like pre-pandemic levels? And then, of course, you've got to put into the equation what's happening with inflation, driven in part by higher prices of raw materials. Now, that doesn't seem to me necessarily about a particularly good, sustainable economic model that can be um, used over the next few years to, to benefit us all. It's a bit lumpy, isn't it? So our view is that we are going to see uh, quite a, a rapid recovery. Um, and that we and the economy is going to get back to its pre-virus trend quite quickly. So you could say that, uh, you know, the policy response has been very successful in sort of um, sustaining that supply uh, side of the economy while we've had restrictions. Um, so, yeah, we're expecting quite a fast and a full recovery. Now, in terms of inflation, certainly uh, we are expecting a kind of a rise in inflation to above 2% in the sort of towards the back end of this year as uh, energy price effects um, sort of uh, push it up and the supply shortages you mentioned. Uh, now, what we don't really expect is for that to, to pass into very strong wage growth um, in the near term. And for that for that reason, you know, we're not expecting increases in inflation to become sustained for, for a few more years yet. And, and ultimately, that will mean that um, interest rates don't rise for a few, few years yet. But I think that's the kind of the, uh, one of the big questions um, at the moment is obviously whether the kind of inflation driven by shortages does actually go through to wage inflation faster than people expect. I suppose the main argument against it is that we just simply, the sort of structure of the labour market these days, it, it doesn't tend to give you sort of those wage price spirals that we used to get. So we probably need to wait for actually labour market shortages, which we still think we're somewhere off to um, rather than material shortages to see that kind of inflation that the Bank of England would have to uh, be really concerned about. Mm. Um, I want to touch on very briefly on the experience within um, the estate agency business. Now, I, I appreciate this is not necessarily going to be central to your um, your, your, your core working and, and what you're analysing and so forth. But we are hearing from estate agents that uh, I think they've got less houses on the books than they've ever had before. Clearly, this goes back to what you were saying. This is simple economics at the top. This lack of supply pushing up prices and so forth. A lot of demand. Do you see that changing at all? Um, we've got this end of the stamp duty holiday expected at the end of this month. We still haven't really heard, have we, whether or not that's going to be extended. What in your mind is needed to try and stir 
activity. What's going to encourage us to start thinking, more of us thinking we want to move, we want to put our houses on the market? Because that, of course, is going to be one of the keys, I guess, to making sure that house price increases remain low or that house, price, house prices start to um, drop a little bit further. Mm. Well, I think the first thing to mention on this idea that there's very little supply is just to, to bear in mind that transactions have been incredibly high. So I think what you're really seeing there is just a very fast moving market. Um, yes, at any one time supply is limited, but actually most we've seen home movers are obviously making up a much larger share of the market than, than, than they have at any time since the financial crisis. And they're all selling at home to, to move. So and I think that's why. Uh, we're expecting that kind of market dynamic to change a bit. It just be kind of um, much less home movers in the market and just a general kind of slowdown in how quickly homes are changing hands and then how long they're on the market for. And that will kind of increase the stock of homes on estate agents books at any time. So I think that's kind of um, the dynamic we expect to change as the stamp duty holiday ends, I suppose. And, and you, you anticipate it ending or do you think the Chancellor will step in at the 11th hour? given how strongly the housing markets uh, performed and also how housing markets in other countries have done, I think that it's not just the stamp duty holiday that has driven this, but also that, you know, I think that support probably needs to be withdrawn now before you get to a point where, you, you know, house price rises start to get to a place where you might be getting a little bit more worried about um, house price valuations. So I think it's probably mm -hmm. wise to to bring it to an end as scheduled in, in June and then, and then September. One, one final question about demand and supply is the amount of houses the government is planning to build. Where, where are we with all this? Because successive governments have tried and perhaps maybe failed in targets when, when looking at how many houses they want to build. Land is obviously a problem. Um, but um, the pandemic has, has changed, certainly in London, it's changed the, the numbers of people by some small degree. Um, we, we, we know that that's, that's been evidenced. But are we not building enough homes? What is it that's going on? Or are we just wanting more homes per person? Yeah, I think the supply um, issue, uh, well, pre-pandemic anyway, was definitely focused in in London and the South East. That's where you saw those very high house price to earnings ratios, very high rent to earnings ratios. So it'll be very interesting to see whether, I mean, it's a lot easier to shift demand than supply, I suppose, when you're talking about houses. So it'll be very interesting to see whether that kind of adjusts. But um, yeah, I think ultimately, you know, supply has been quite limited really since you saw the end of really large government house building programs, which the last time you saw that was the 70s. Uh, since then, we've always seen supply be about 10% of transactions, um, which I think reflects the fact that landowners and home builders only really want to increase supply at a rate that doesn't obviously reduce the market price they can they, they can secure. So unless you're going to have, you know, bring back compulsory purchase orders and big uh, social house building projects, I don't really think the government's going to manage to make a huge difference. The one caveat to that might be that what they're trying to do is kind of make the planning system a lot more transparent. And the one thing that could allow is, is smaller house builders to to more easily gain planning permission with much less cost. Uh, so if they succeeded in doing that, potentially a little bit more competition amongst house builders might allow you to increase supply in some places a bit. But um, yeah, I don't think it's going to be uh, a huge surge in supply anywhere. Interesting. Andrew, we'll have to leave it there, but thanks indeed for joining us. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for your time. Uh, that's yeah. Andrew Wishart. He's UK property economist at Capital Economics. For more videos like these, follow us on Twitter and Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel.